This was brought to you by The Storyteller on YouTube and Facebook. Lurking Fear by H.P. Lovecraft 1. The Shadow on the Chimney There was thunder in the air on the night I went to the deserted mansion top Tempest Mountain on the Lurking Fear. I was not alone. Her full heartiness was not then mixed with that love of the grotesque, the terrible, which had made my career a series of quests for strange horrors in literature and life. With me were two faithful and muscular men for whom I had sent when the time came. Men long associated with me in my ghastly explorations because of their peculiar fitness. We had started quietly from the village because of the reporters who still lingered about after the Eldridge panic of a month before. The nightmare creeping death. I thought they might aid me, but I did not want them then. Would to God I had let them share this search that I might not have had to bear the secret alone so long. To bear it alone for fear the world would call me mad or go mad itself at the demon implications of the pain. Now that I am telling it anyway, lest the brooding makes me a maniac, I wish I had never concealed it, for I, and I alone, know what manner of fear lurked in the spectral and desolate mountain. In a small motor car we covered the miles of primeval force and hill until the wooded ascent checked it. The country bore an aspect more than usually sinister as we viewed it by night and without the accustomed crowds of investigators so that we were often tempted to use the acetylene headlight despite the attention it might attract. It was not a wholesome landscape after dark, and I believe I would have noticed its morbidity even had I been ignorant of the terror that stalked it. Of the wild creatures there were none. They are wise when death lears close. The ancient Lightning scared trees seemed unnaturally large and twisted, and the other vegetation unnaturally thick and feverish, while curious mounds of hummocks in the weedy, alderate, pitted earth reminded me of snakes and dead men's skulls swelled to gigantic proportions. Fear had lurked on Tempest Mountain for more than a century. This I learned at once from newspaper accounts of the catastrophe which first brought the region to the world's notice. The place is a remote, lonely elevation in that part of the Catskills where Dutch civilization once feebly and transiently penetrated, leaving behind as it receded only a few ruined mansions and a dead, degenerate squatter population inhabiting pitiful hamlets on isolated slopes. Normal beings seldom visited the locality 
until the state police were formed, and even now, only infrequent troopers patrol it. The fear, however, is an old tradition throughout the neighboring villages. Since it is a prime topic in the simple discourse of the poor mongrels who sometimes leave their valleys to trade hand woven baskets for such primitive necessities as they cannot shoot, raise, or make, the lurking fear dwelt in the shunned and deserted Martin's mansion, which crowned the high but gradual eminence, whose liability to frequent thunderstorms gave it the name of Tempest Mountain. For over a hundred years, the antique rogue circled stone house had been the subject of stories incredibly wild and monstrously hideous. Stories of a silent, colossal, creeping death which stalked abroad in summer. With whimpering assistance, the squatters told tales of a demon which seized lone wayfarers after dark, either carrying them off or leaving them in a frightful state of gnawed dismemberment. While sometimes they whispered of blood trails toward the distant mansion. Some said the thunder called the lurking fear out of its habitation, while others said the thunder was its voice. No one outside the backwoods had believed these varying and conflicting stories with their incoherent, extravagant, descriptions of the half-glimpsed theme, yet not a farmer or villager doubted that the Martin's mansion was foolishly haunted. Local history forbade such a doubt, although no ghostly evidence was ever found by such investigators as had visited the building after some especially vivid tale of the squatters. Grandmothers told strange myths of the Martins' specters, myths concerning the Martins' family itself, its queer heredity, dissimilarity of eyes, its long, unnatural panels, and the murder which cursed it. The terror which brought me to the sense was a sudden and pretentious confirmation of the mountaineer's wildest legends. One summer night, after a thunderstorm of unprecedented violence, the countryside was aroused by a squatter stampede which no mere delusion could create. The pitiful throngs of natives shrieked and whined of the unnameable horror which had descended upon them. They were not doubted. They had not seen it, but had heard such cries from one of their hamlets that they knew a creeping death had come. In the morning, citizens and state troopers followed the shuddering mountaineers to the place where they said the death had come. Death was indeed there, the ground under one of 
the squatters' villages had caved in after a lightning stroke, destroying several of the Maladors' shanties. But upon this property, damage was superimposed in organic devastation, which paled it to insignificance of a possible 75 natives who had inhabited this spot. Not one living specimen, specimen was visible. The disordered earth was covered with blood and human debris. He's speaking too vividly the ravages of demon teeth and talons. Yet no visible trail led away from the carnage. That some hideous animal must be lost. Everyone quickly agreed. Nor did any tongue now revive the charge that such cryptid deaths formed merely the sordid murders common in decadent communities. That charge was revived only when about 25 of the estimated population was found missing from the dead. And even then, it was hard to explain the murder of 50 by half that number. But the fact remained that on a summer night, a bolt had come out of the heavens and left a dead village whose corpse were mangled, chewed, and clawed. The exciting countryside immediately connected the horror with the haunted mansions. Mansion. Though the localities were over three miles apart, the troopers were more skeptical, including the mansion, only casually in their investigation and dropping it altogether when they found it thoroughly deserted. Country and village people, however, canvassed the place with infinite care, overturning everything in the house, sounding ponds and brooks, beating down bushes, ransacking the nearby forts. All was in vain. The death that had come had left no trace, save destruction by the second day of the search, the affair was fully treated by the newspaper, whose reporters overran Tempest Mountain. They described it in much detail and with many interviews to elucidate the horror story as told by local randoms. I followed the accounts languidly at first, for I am a connoisseur in horrors, but after a week I detected an atmosphere which stirred me oddly, so that on August 5th, 1921, I registered among the reporters who crowded the hotel at Leffert's Corner nearest village to Tempest Mountain and acknowledged headquarters of the searchers. Three weeks more and the dispersal of the reporters left me free to begin a terrible exploration based on the minute inquiries and surveying with which I had meanwhile busy myself. So on the summer night, while distant thunders rumbled, I left a silent motor car and trampled with two armed companions up the last mound covered reaches of 
campus now, casting the beams of an electric torch on the spectral gray walls that began to appear through giant oaks ahead. In this morbid night solitude, the evil shifting illumination, the vast box-like pile displayed obscure hints of terror, which day could not cover. But I did not hesitate since I had come with a fierce resolution to test an idea. I believe that the thunder called the death demon now of some fearsome secret place. Indeed, that demon saw an entity or vaporous pestilence I meant to see it. I had thoroughly searched the ruin before, hence knew my plan well. Choosing as the seat of my vigil the old room of Jan Martins, whose murder looms so great the rural legends. I felt sub subtly that the apartment of this ancient victim was best for my purpose. The chamber, measuring about 20 feet square, contained, like the other rooms, some rubbish which had been furniture. It lay on the second story of the southeast corner of the house and had an immense east window and narrow south window, both devoid of panes or shutters. Opposite the large window was an enormous Dutch fireplace with scriptural tiles representing the prodigal sun in the opposite narrow window was a spacious bed built into the wall. As the tree muffled thunder grew louder, I arranged my plans details. First I fastened side by side to the ledge of the large window three rope ladders which I had brought with me. I knew they reached a suitable spot on the grass outside, for I had tested them. Then the three of us dragged from another room a wide four-poster bedstead, crowding it literally against the window. Having strewn it with her bows all now rested on with drawn automatics, two relaxing while the third watch. From whatever direction the demon might come, our potential escape was provided. If it came from within the house, we had the window ladders. If from outside the door and the stairs. He did not think, judging from president, that it would pursue us far, even at worst. I watched from midnight to one o'clock when in spite of the sinister house, the unprotected window and the approaching thunder and lightning. I felt singularly drowsy. I was between my two companions, George Bennett, being toward the window, and William Toby towards the fireplace. Bennett was asleep, having felt the same anomalous drowsiness that affected me. So I designated Toby for the next watch, although even he was not. It is curious how intently I had been watching that fireplace. The increasing thunder 
must have affected my dreams, for in the brief time I slept there came to me apocalyptic visions. Once I partly have awakened, probably because the sleeper towards the window had rest and sleep flung an arm across my chest. I was not sufficiently awake to see whether Toby was attending to his duties as the sin, but felt distinct anxiety on that score. Never before had the presence of evil so poignantly oppressed me. Later, I must have dropped to sleep again, for it was out of phantasmal chaos that my mind leaped when the night grew hideous with streaks beyond anything in my former experience or imagination. In that streaking, the inmost soul of human fear and agony clawed hopelessly and insanely at the ebony gates of oblivion. I awoke to red madness and the mockery of Diabolism as far farther and farther down inconceivable vistas that phobic and crystalline anger, anguish retreated and reverberated. There was no light, but I knew from the space at my right that Toby was gone. God alone knew whither. Across my chest still lay the heavy arm of the sleeper at my left. Then came the devastating stroke of lightning which shook the whole mountain, lit the darkness crypts of the hoary grove and splintered the patriarch of the twisted trees. In the demon flash of the monstrous fireball, the sleeper started up suddenly while the glare from beyond the window threw his shadow vividly upon the chimney above the fireplace from which my eyes had never strayed. That I am alive and sane is a marvel. I cannot fathom. I cannot fathom it. For the shadow of the chimney was not that of George Benton or any other human creature, but a blasphemous abnormality from hell's nethermost craters. A nameless, shapeless abomination which no mind could fully grasp and no pen even partly described. In another second, I was alone in the accursed mansion, shivering and gibbering. George Bennett and William Toby had left no courage, not even a struggle. They were never heard of again. This was brought to you by The Storyteller on YouTube and Facebook. Listen to our podcast on any of these platforms. Anchor. Breaker. Overcast. Pocket Casts. Radio Public. Spotify. Support us on Patreon. And check us out on Discord. All the links can be found in the video description below. We thank you for your participation. If you enjoyed please like, subscribe, share, make comments. We love feedback.